The real guarantors of the peace process were the people of Ireland when they voted by referendum in May 1998 to choose and underpin the agreement. They were the real guarantors. None of the the main two parties in this House had a vote in that referendum, nor did the two parties uh, in Washington uh, either. So let's be very clear who are the real guarantors. And in the context, Sir Roger, of a debate that is taking place because we're told we have to go by the imperative of the referendum that took place on June the 23rd last year. Let people recognise that there is still an imperative that goes back to the joint referendum, that articulated act of self-determination by the Irish people that chose to underpin and agree the Good Friday Agreement. And the Right Honourable Member for North Shropshire says he does not want uncertainty. Uncertainty is being created by Brexit as far as the Good Friday Agreement is concerned. And the Right Honourable Gentleman and nobody else in this House should be surprised when they start to hear that the negotiations that take place after the Assembly elections will be dealing not just with the questions of scandal and the lack of accountability and transparency and the smugness and the arrogance that was displayed uh, by parties in government, but also go to the core of implications for the agreement as a result of Brexit. Because the fact is, When you look at the Good Friday uh, Agreement, as wrongly dismissed by others, the EU is mentioned. It's there in Strand 1, it's there in Strand 2. One of the most expansive references is in relation to the competence of the North South Ministerial Council. It's also there in Strand 3. And, of course, it is also there in the key preamble uh, of the agreement between uh, the Government of the UK and the Government uh, of Ireland that refers to their common membership of the EU, because that, as John Hume always predicted, provided both the model and the context for our peace uh, process. And it is no uh, accident that when somebody like John Hume, who drove so much of the principles and the method into the Good Friday Agreement, that whenever he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, just look at that speech how many of the references there were to the signal role and the special contribution that Europe had played and would play, and the experience of common membership of the EU uh, would play. And that's why he said then, I want to see Ireland, north and south, the wounds of violence healed, play its rightful role in a Europe that will, for all Irish people, be a shared bond of patriotism and new endeavour. And of course, when he enunciated those words in 1998, that wasn't actually a new concept. We can look across here and see the plaque commemorating uh, Tom Kettle, a former member of this House who gave his life in the First World War. And before that war, he actually said that his programme for Ireland consisted in equal parts of Home Rule and the Ten Commandments. And he said, my only counsel to Ireland is that to become deeply Irish, she must become European. And of course, while fighting that war and before he gave his life, he said, used with the wisdom that is sown in tears and blood, this tragedy of Europe may be and must be the prologue to the two reconciliations of which all statesmen have dreamed, the reconciliation of Protestant Ulster with Ireland and the reconciliation of Ireland with Great Britain. And that reconciliation was best achieved and best expressed when we had the Good Friday Agreement, so overwhelmingly endorsed in this House and so overwhelmingly endorsed by referendum by the Irish people north and south. Now, we know some people did not endorse it, and some people withheld their endorsement and refused to recognise that referendum result. And some of them are the same people who are telling us now that we have to abide by the referendum result in respect of Brexit, that we have to ignore the wishes of the people of Northern Ireland in respect of remaining in the EU, just as they said that we had to ignore the wishes of the people in Northern Ireland in respect of the Good Friday Agreement uh, itself. So do not let anybody be under any misapprehension that there are implications for the Good Friday Agreement, because when we hear this lip service that we get from uh, the government, and then the rest of us are meant to lip sync along to this lip service about frictionless borders and about the common travel area, all those things about the border experience and the common travel area and those matters actually predate the agreement uh, itself. So addressing those issues and those concerns, one, the terms in which they are addressed aren't reliable, and two, they are not relevant to protecting some of the aspects of the agreement itself, which is why the amendments, Sir Roger, that we have tabled that come in this group are so important. The Honourable Member for Forrester Dean already referred to new clause 150, which appears on uh, page 75 of uh, the book. Uh, we also have tabled uh, a key uh, amendment in terms of amendment number 86, uh, which the Honourable Member for St Helens has previously uh, referred to when he addressed his new clause 109. 
And there are uh, also amendments 88 and 92, which deal with questions around the competence of the devolved uh, Assembly uh, and the need for consent in respect of any changes to the competence of that Assembly or of devolved Ministers. Remember, those amendments are not about the question of the Assembly giving consent to the triggering of Article 50, so it is not about the same question that went to the Supreme Court, but it is about issues and principles that were addressed and are expressed in the judgment of the Supreme Court uh, that too many people have sought to uh, ignore. As a supposed co-guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement, the UK Government is meant to have a duty to protect and develop that agreement. And indeed, various ministers have told us that they have no intention of allowing Brexit uh, to undermine the agreement. If that is so, there should be no difficulty in having that commitment on the face of this Bill. <coughs> Politically, we all have to conclude from the Supreme Court judgment that no matter what principles have been agreed or established, none of us can have recourse to their legal adherence without their explicit inclusion in legislation and or a treaty. We, therefore, have a duty to be vigilant against any legislative terms which could be used to relegate the crucial importance of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 and or the Belfast Agreement more widely. And, Sir Roger, those sponsoring and supporting this bill do so arguing the need to respect the outcome of the referendum on June 23 uh, last. And so we make no apologies for highlighting the primacy that has to be accorded to the overwhelming uh, endorsement by referendum. Over nearly 72 per cent of people in Northern Ireland, 96 per cent of people in the south of Ireland on the 22nd of May 1998. They do give way. I think the uh, Honourable Gentleman is talking about some extraordinarily challenging and difficult issues which could have some very serious implications in Northern Ireland. It seems to me it is our duty, all of us who want to see Northern Ireland prosper and go forward, to recognise the fact that the UK is exiting the EU and we have to make the most of it. So will the Honourable Gentleman commit to this House that he will not make divisions over Brexit a part of the campaign for the SDLP during the Northern Ireland elections? I, I think the honourable member has uh, some neck to try to ask the SDLP not to make divisions over Brexit an issue in the election. Are the people of Northern Ireland whose wishes in the, were clearly expressed in the referendum last year are being ignored? Are we now to tell them, ignore your own wishes as well? Do you expect a party like the SDLP that honourably fought a, re- a campaign to remain? Do you, would, does the honourable member obviously expect us uh, to say, no, ignore your wishes, uh, set them aside? You have to be slaves to the impulses of uh, votes uh, in England in response to some crazy uh, arguments. I would ask the honourable member to address the fact that the current terms of Clause 1 uh, sub clause 2, deny any regard whatsoever to protecting the constitutional, institutional or rights provisions of the Good Friday uh, Agreement or their due reflection in the 1998 Act. And that is why we have tabled Amendment 86. As it stands, Clause 1, sub clause 2 of the Bill uh, seeks to ensure that this Bill would not be restricted by any other legislation <coughs> whatsoever. Amendment 86 would create an exception for the Northern Ireland Act 1998 uh, from that. It would also crucially uphold the collateral principles that are in the other part of the Good Friday Agreement, which is between the governments of the UK and Ireland and not fully reflected in the 1998 Act. Uh, Amendment 86 would also accept Section 2 of the Ireland Act of 1949. Uh, from the override power that is contained in this bill or its outworkings. And I admit, Sir Roger, that the amendment would act as a boundary on the powers provided to the Prime Minister by Clause 1, uh, sub Clause 1, uh, and galvanise the protection for the agreement. But given that the Prime Minister is trying to tell us that she would observe those boundaries, why should she fear it being put on the, pla- on the face of the bill? I turn now to new Clause 150, which draws on key language from the Good Friday Agreement uh, itself, as I made clear to the Honourable Member for Forest, uh, for Forest of Dean. Uh, it is intended to ensure that any future UK-EU treaty, and we are told the Government wants to negotiate a new UK-EU treaty, will make explicit reference to upholding the fundamental constitutional precept of the Good Friday uh, Agreement. 
and that is the principle of consent and the principle of consent being uh, one that affords a democratic route uh, to a united Ireland if that ever becomes the wish of a majority of people in Northern Ireland. And in the case of any such future referendum, there must be no uncertainty, no uncertainty whatsoever, that could hang over Northern Ireland's direct admission to the EU as a consequence of a vote for United Ireland, or indeed any uncertainty over Ireland's terms of membership of the European uh, Union. We saw such uncertainty deployed during the Scottish referendum when people said, don't make assumptions about Scotland having an automatic place in the EU or it's going to be easy, Article 49 will be very difficult and all of that. The difference in the Northern Ireland situation is Northern Ireland doesn't have the choice of becoming a state, a new state. It, under the Good Friday Agreement, its only choice is membership of the United Kingdom, membership of the United Ireland. That agreement was made at a time when they both had common membership of the EU. Any referendum we have in the future won't exist in that situation. So lots of people can raise question marks about whether or not then there would be a straightforward entry into the EU for Northern Ireland in that context. And that could, in the terms of a Good Friday Agreement, constitute an external impediment an external impediment in the exercise of that choice or even when it comes to the choice to have a referendum itself. And this is an issue that the Taoiseach identified last year at the McGill Summer School last uh, summer. It will be an issue for the Irish Government as one of the 27 when they come to negotiate their side of the treaty. It would be odd if it is an issue for the Irish Government as a co-guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement to want to see this reflected in a new UK-EU treaty. And it is not an issue for the British government as a co-guarantor of that agreement as well. It should be something that they are equally and comfortably committed to. Because let us remember, this key precept around the principle of consent and the democratic choice for United Ireland, as reflected in a referendum in 1998, is the key point that allowed those people those people who locked themselves under the nonsense idea that they supported violence sourced in a mandate from the 1918 election. That's what turned it. That's what was the key for quite a number of people saying physical force has no more place in the course of Irish politics. Physical force is now parked because the Irish people as a whole have in this generation by self-determination, articulated self-determination, upheld this agreement, and that gives them the right, by further articulated self-determination, to achieve unity in the future. Anything that diminishes or qualifies or damages that key precept will cause damage to the agreement. And people need to understand, you need to know the difference, uh, Sir Roger, between a stud wall and a supporting wall. Just knocking something through because it's just convenient and gives you a bit more space might be grand and might do. But if at some future point, whenever other pressures arise, uh, things start coming down uh, around us, people should not then complain. So we have to be diligent and vigilant on these matters, uh, Sir Roger. I would also point out that the German precedent, which some people have told us would apply automatically, would not. It was under a different treaty. And remember, the German precedent partly relied on the fact that the West German constitution, recognised by the then EC treaty, had a territorial claim of jurisdiction over all of Germany, that the basic law applied. Of course, that is not the case now in respect of Ireland, because Articles 2 and 3 were changed, rightly and properly, in the context of the Good Friday Agreement. But that should not be confounded by people, because of the way in which Brexit Uh, takes its course uh, over the years to come. So that is why we have to take care of these things now. And it is not just the Taoiseach who raised this uh, last summer. It is quite clear that the Joint Oireachtas Committee of the Doyle and the Shannon uh, is also prioritising this as an issue. This is going to be a feature in a report, I believe, that they will make as well. And can I advise ministers that our Amendment 86 and quite possibly our new Clause 150 will also be tabled in the House of Lords? and they will be tabled by Lord Murphy, Paul Murphy, who piloted the 98 Act through this House. Paul Murphy, who chaired the Strand 1 negotiations. Everybody thinks George Mitchell chaired all of the negotiations to do with the Good Friday Agreement. He did not chair Strand 1, some of the most detailed negotiations. Paul Murphy chaired that, and he represented uh, the British Government in the Str- for most of the time in the Strand 2 negotiations as well. Now, if someone of his experience and insight at that time, and in the role he played as Secretary of State since, can see the importance and uh, the, the salient, uh, crucial need to protect the agreement.
by something like Amendment 86 and something like a new clause 150. Who are other people in this House to dismiss that point, that experience or that insight, as well as dismissing the clear wishes of the people of Northern Ireland? And finally, Sir Roger, I want to address uh, Amendment 88 and Amendment 92 which make uh, provision for any change to the legislative competence of the Assembly or executive competence of the Executive to require the consent of the uh, Assembly. And, Sir Roger, that does address issues that did find expression in the uh, Supreme Court judgment. There has been a false shorthand around the Supreme Court judgment uh, that has basically uh, said that no aspect of Sewell uh, ever applies or can ever apply in any way, and that is not what the Supreme Court uh, actually said. At paragraph 151, they said, We do not underestimate the importance of constitutional conventions, some of which play a fundamental role in the operation of our Constitution. The Sewell Convention has an important role in facilitating harmonious relationships between the UK Parliament and the devolved legislators. But the point is a simple one. If this House does not uphold this Convention at this time on such an important change in the governance of Northern Ireland, what then is left of that uh, Convention? And we need to remember that the Good Friday Agreement is based not just on the principle of consent, but it is based on the promise and the exercise of trust and reliable adherence. And we have a situation now where this Parliament has not been seen to keep its side of what was assumed to be the bargain and the understanding, uh, the compact between all of the people of Northern Ireland, the people of Ireland and between the governments of these uh, islands. And that is why we have provided Amendment uh, 88 and 92. And in respect of Amendment 92, I would just want members to understand that it is important that the government indicate that they understand what what new changes there will be to the competency of the Northern Ireland Assembly and when it will happen. Because if, as we have been told, and it came up in earlier exchanges from honourable mem- with, uh, between honourable members from Wales, if we are told that the Great Devolution Bill, when it comes, will involve competencies over rights, over environmental standards, been held in some sort of holding pattern here before being subsequently devolved. That could do serious injury to rights, protections and promises under the Good Friday Agreement. Because if we have dilution of those rights or those standards before devolution, in the Northern Ireland Assembly we will not be able to top those back up to the pre-existing EU standards without cross-community support, something that will probably be denied courtesy of the DUP, just as they have abused and misused the uh, parallel consent uh, principles, the petition of concern, uh, to block other rights. A mechanism that was meant to be there to protect rights has actually been used to frustrate uh, rights. So we have to make sure that in relation to the journey of the transfer of powers and competencies from Brussels to the UK, there is no that it is clear that it is devolution straight to devolution, do not pass go, do not collect two hundred uh, pounds, that there is no dirty work at the crossroads as far as diluting rights and standards are concerned. And that is why those issues are addressed. And that will be a key issue in Strand One. And it will become an issue in the negotiations which take place after this election. And those negotiations will touch on the issue of the petition of concern itself, but it will also touch on it in relation to the context that has been created by uh, Brexit in terms of further powers that might be coming to the uh, Assembly. And similarly, as the Honourable Member for St Helens has said, the question of Strand 2 will arise in those negotiations. Because the Good Friday Agreement made a commitment that there would be six implementation bodies on a cross-border basis, at least six. The six that were created after the Good Friday Agreement were, by the insistence of the Ulster Unionist Party, which was then the only Unionist Party negotiating at that stage, all related to areas that either dealt a lot with European funding or dealt with questions of common compliance with European standards. If we no longer have common European funding, if we no longer have the issues of common compliance, then the rationale for those existing bodies has gone. There have to be six new bodies. That opens up a whole area of negotiations. That brings us essentially into a review of the Good Friday Agreement. I give way. I'm grateful. Before there are any new bodies or any more reviews, does the Honourable Member not agree that the priority for the people of Northern Ireland should be to get a working Assembly, to re-elect a working Executive, to get on with running Northern Ireland? All these things can then be dealt with, because without that, 
there's going to be no more devolution of anything, it seems. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and my party and I are fully pledged to doing that. Nobody worked harder to create the principles and the precepts of the agreement and to get those institutions established and up and running. And we did so with very good assistance, I have to tell the Honourable Member for North Shropshire, from the EU. As someone who was a minister in Northern Ireland, both finance minister and deputy first minister, I had many negotiations with many people in the EU, including Michel Barnier who was very constructive and very helpful in relation to a number uh, of funding issues. Yes, he had his particularisms uh, about which one had, to, and one had to understand where he was coming from, and certainly his officials had to understand where he was coming from, but it was a, use, but it was a useful and constructive contribution, uh, one of many from the EU. Uh, thank the member for, for giving way. Is he trying to say here now that if Article 50 is triggered, that we will no longer have inter-trade Ireland, we will no longer... Uh, have uh, Waterways Ireland and Tourism Ireland and those six bodies that were set up by the Belfast Agreement? Because I don't see any threat to them by uh, triggering Article 50. I would point out to the Honourable Member that his party was the party who said if we are going to go ahead and agree these implementation bodies, the cover has to be that the way in which we can show that they meet our test of mutual benefit is that they are dealing with matters that largely transpose EU business, either questions of common compliance, such as the food safety body, Waterways Ireland has some issues of environmental compliance, similarly the LOX agency has issues of environmental compliance, and of course there is also the question of uh, EU funding. And as the Honourable Member for St Helens said earlier, you have the EU uh, special EU programmes body. Uh, it is not going to exist if there is no common EU uh, funding to be available anymore. And if the rationale and justification for the existing bodies is wounded and is weakened, then those of us who negotiated and supported the agreement have the right to say we have already had nearly 20 years where we have had this limited area of co- implementation cooperation. It now needs to be developed and expanded as the agreement promised it could be. If the existing bodies are wounded and winged by the fact of Brexit, if they limp along for relevance, then clearly there has to be, in the context of a review, at least of Strand 2, if not the wider agreement, negotiations on new bodies. And those negotiations, as we know, will not find themselves unlinked to other issues and other factors as well. So, (coughs) honourable members of this House who have uh, hummed to themselves that Brexit has no implications for the Good Friday Agreement, and that so long as they say they are going to consult ministers, and so long as they say they do not want border posts, no other damage has been done, they do not understand the politics that went into the agreement, they do not understand the politics that is going to upset the workings of that agreement by the implications of Brexit. And that is why, if people have a care for the Good Friday Agreement, they should have no problem with Amendment 86. Because if people want to vote against Amendment 86 on Wednesday, they are voting against the idea that you can have the Good Friday Agreement at the same time as you pursue Brexit. 